joy it is to be in the house of the Lord one more time Amen. we're grateful for all of you who have made the effort to come and celebrate with us tonight we had a marvelous time on last night uh, had a chance to come down and run all in the aisles and carry on you know amen tonight I think we'll go to the classroom amen praise the Lord Brother called me a young man. <laughs> I asked Reverend Jones if he's talking about him. All that <laughs> it couldn't be me. He's about him. Amen. But it's so good to be here again tonight. Thank God for Pastor Snargrass. I did communicate with him earlier this evening. And he wasn't at his best. And I told him, no, you need to stay home. Amen get some rest I'm, I'm hoping we can go to first watch and he loves that gravy train so go out and eat a little bit of gravy train hang out together before Pastor Nero went to heaven we used to go to breakfast all the time together and break bread and of course it was two navy men against the army man so <laughs> I was always the odd man out but they, both of them were just precious people as we sat and shared and talked to one another and loved each other. And I love that brother. Some other men here that I love, Pastor Kevin McNeil is one of my sons. He and Betty, a precious daughter of mine. Thank God for seeing you guys tonight. I see Pastor Jerome Tolliver, who is another son uh, of mine, a man who really demonstrate love to his pastor. Amen. Thank you, uh, Pastor Tolliver, for being here tonight. Appreciate you as well. I uh, saw some other preachers. Uh, Pastor Tony Johnson, a dear friend. Tony, I love you, man. Yeah, he said, yeah. That brother right there is an encourager. He knows how to encourage other preachers. He, he always is an encourager to my wife and me. Every time we run into, I call him TJ. <laughs> but he's a lover of preachers and good preaching. So I thank God for you tonight. Pastor Johnson, been in the house and all of these preachers and evangelists. Last night, I failed to mention Tracy Reed was in the house, as well as Erica Cox and Connie Goodlow, three evangelists from our church. And I thank God for them, uh, who are awesome preachers in their own right. And I thank God for God raising up some women who can say it. Amen. Amen. And uh, our deacons who are here tonight. They were here last night. Sylvester Jackson Jr. is here tonight. Good to see you. Amen. I thank God for all of you who have come to celebrate with us. Damon Scott, this preacher over here on the drums. Bless you, preacher. Good to see you. Young preacher. Amen. Good to see you, man. Every, almost, I think, I don't know that uh, Minister Scott has missed a year since I've been coming here 12 years now, and he's always here to support. Blessings to you. Amen. Amen. I wish nothing but the best for him. A young man who loves God. Amen. Loves preaching. And uh, I caught him on Facebook saying it. I'm like, hey, look at him. Has some stuff. Coming on up, Doc. Lord is blessing you. Thank God for all of these ministers here. My dear friend, IBS Groves, the Reverend IBS Groves Jr. Amen. I did, I don't know how many revivals for him. Back in the day, we were talking about it last night when I started going down to Mount Olive. We were preaching six nights, amen. We started on a Sunday and preached every night up to, I think, Friday night. Up through Friday night, up to Easter Sunday. It was, they cut it down to three days now, I think. <laughs> amen. Yeah, yeah. He said the people rose up. That's too long, amen. So, so. 
I think I only got in on a couple of them three night revivals. Most of the time I came down there, it was six, six nights. We went down to Shirley and I'd go down on a Sunday. And uh, yeah, six nights. Amen. Yeah. I don't know, but God was good. He gave us some stuff every night. <laughs> so we appreciate the Lord. It's good for us to be here. I do want to acknowledge uh, my dear friend and uh, companion that's never been a hindrance to me in the ministry before we go to the word of God. Uh, amen. Years ago, they called a little bird. And Sister Little Bird, that's what, the, that's what the evangelistic team and other people used to call all the time. But I'll call her 97 and a half pounds of pure sugar. Amen. <laughs> Would you stand, honey? There's some new people in here tonight that wasn't here last night. Let them see who you are. I thank God for her. We had a marvelous time on last night, and, and we talked about the divine love of God, the benefits, the consequences, and the outgrowth of God's divine love from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. I want to stay with John again tonight, but we're going to go to his gospel. John is second only to the Apostle Paul as how prolific he is in his offerings in the New Testament. He wrote five books in the New Testament are three letters and two books, if you will, the gospel of John, first, second, and third John, and then the book of Revelation. As I said to you on last night, John did not write his own mind. He did not pin his own mind. He was what is called theologically an amanuensis. He was a private secretary for the spirit of God to breathe through him the mind of God. So he literally penned the mind of God. He wrote what the mind of God was, Sister Vonda Jackson. And now we have it today as a guide for us, as uh, a way to look at what took place during the first century and to practically apply, practically apply some of the principles and precepts to our own lives today as we seek to be about our Father's business. And so that's really what it's all about at the end of the day, is it not? So we thank God for what John has done. Uh, his writings are incredible. There are three major discourses in the New Testament economy. There, there, there are a lot of discourses, but three major discourses. Um, the Olivet Discourse is found in Matthew chapters 24 and 25. And um, the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, and then the Upper Room Discourse, which is where we want to go to tonight, the Upper Room Discourse. It encompasses five chapters in John, chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. All happen on one night at one setting. Jesus trying to prepare his disciples for the time that he would be taken away from them. So he starts to encourage them back in chapter 13. He washes their feet and he tells them about a new commandment that he's given to them, which is not really a new commandment that they should love one another. The fact of the matter is, he says in that 13th chapter, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. Watch this now. Wait a minute. If you have love one to another. And, uh, and then in chapter 14, he helps them to recognize that he's going to be leaving them. He's going to be taken away from them. Uh, but he says that he's going to give them another comforter. Another comforting thought was, he says, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. That's why I'm going, to get a spot ready for you. <laughs> After a while, you can come hang out with me where I am. And uh, so he gave them really good news. And in the end of that 14th chapter, he told them, peace I leave with you, my peace. I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He's working to help them to understand that he's going away. But he said, I'll send you another comforter. Another, meaning another one like me. And he said that that one would be alongside of them, a paraclete, a paracletos. One that comes alongside. And then he said, and he shall be in you. And he'll bring to your remembrance whatsoever I have said to you. Helping them to understand that they'll never be alone. Amen. 
In the 16th chapter, he further helps them to understand. Verse 33, these things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. He says, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. He helps them to understand, you have everything that you have need of, or you will have, because after the day of Pentecost, they of course are on the day of Pentecost, they are empowered by the Spirit of God to give them what they have need of to be about their father's business. But in the 15th chapter, he does something a little bit different. He helps them to understand their call. He helps them to understand why it was that he picked them. Last night we talked a little bit about being picked by God and chosen by him to be about his business. But tonight, I want to look at the nuts and bolts of why. Many times people say, you know, I don't understand what God's will is for me. I don't know why God called me. And when we looked at it last night, there was some 7 billion, 655 million, 957,369 people on the planet in 2018. Almost 8 billion people on the planet. And out of that 8 billion, many entered into eternity without the knowledge of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Which means they're going to be eternally separated from him. But then there were some others that God chose to be his own. Pastor McNeil, he picked some folk from out of that bunch. And they, and they were not, it wasn't because they looked better or smelled better or came from better families or because they lived on the right side of the track or their house was big enough or none of that. It was because God's eternal love was manifest toward them and he chose them to be his own. You know, the thing I love about Apostle Paul is in Ephesians chapter 1, he helps them to understand he did it before the foundation of the world. Are you listening? Before God created anything, he already knew that in 1947 in Oak Muggy, Oklahoma, at 1208 East Lafayette Street, with Dr. A.M. Stevens in attendance, Jesse Frazier would come up on the planet. The 11th of 11 children to Melvin and Montel Frazier. Amen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 11. Yeah, I'm, I, matter of fact, I'm the last of 11. All 10 of my brothers and sisters are gone. My mama and daddy's gone. I'm the last of my family. The generation. God has been good. I, I'm, 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 like my, I'm like my daughter over here that said, I didn't pick. I, 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 I wasn't. What did you say? You wasn't milking cows. Wasn't riding in no wagon. Born right here in Kansas City, but God is still good. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Yeah, I don't know. Y all, y all, you, you had to be very careful when you let Sylvester Jackson have a microphone. He wrecked our house Sunday. Man! Yeah, he, he, he wrecked that place. He just kept on singing. After a while, in the, and right at the end of a song, he said, ah, 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 I thought, <laughs> I thought he was going to tune up on a brother. <laughs> Man, just, it's kind of like having a house that had a little bit of flame in it, and somebody come in and just threw gas in there and just blew the place up. Matter of fact, Kelly White got a breakthrough. She just shouting and dancing. She, her new knees, man, she worked it. Shouted a while, danced a while. I said, hey, Kelly got a breakthrough. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I love her because she ain't letting nobody keep her down, boy. She gonna have her say. <laughs> yeah, her husband just standing back fanning. <laughs> Gone, Kelly. <laughs> but this business of understanding why your call or why God chose you is important and that's going to be the practical application of our lesson tonight so i won't be hooping and tuning like last night running up and down running up and down the aisles like last night i just want to take you to the classroom is that all right take you to the classroom john chapter 15 just one verse of scripture and then of course we'll have to walk around a little bit in the in the narrative 
John chapter 15 verse 16 for our lesson tonight. John chapter 15, St. John chapter 15. The beloved disciple Boanerges, one of the sons of thunder. He and his brother James were called by Jesus the sons of thunder. And God, upon the conversion of John, uh, came, uh, well, in, in his journey, uh, was a disciple, he says of himself, whom Jesus loved. And so, here's a precious man. I'm reading from the King James rendering of this particular text. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. My topic tonight, I just kind of want to hang my thoughts on the topic called to be fruitful. God has called us to be fruitful. Every born again believer has been called by God to be fruitful. My purpose is, I just want to remind us of the reason God called you and me. Just to remind us, because sometimes in the uh, process of life and all of what's going on down here on the ground and the kind of places we can find ourselves in and the situations and circumstances that we're confronted with on a daily basis, sometimes our spirituality and what we should be about can kind of get lost in the fray. Sometimes when people are really pushing us and pushing our buttons, so to speak, we can kind of lay our legend on the shelf if we're not careful. A amen, amen, amen. We have, to be, we have to be careful, uh, amen, how we, how we navigate life down here. I, I was uh, with some people from our church. A couple of weeks ago, we went to Atlanta, Georgia, and toured the King Center and all of the wonderful sites there in Atlanta and downtown Atlanta and had just wonderful meals and whatnot. And then we left Atlanta and went to uh, Memphis, Tennessee. And when we went to Memphis, we went to uh, a restaurant called Itabina, which is uh, the hometown of of B.B. Uh, King. And Itabina restaurant was atop of B.B. King's nightclub. While we were up there eating, we couldn't hear uh, just a little muffle of sounds going on down on the, on the first floor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and upstairs, we were in the high class area where, where the waiter came with a towel all across his arm and, you know, and, and served everybody. And this guy was outstanding. I mean, we left him a good tip. He was outstanding in his service and he did the kind of things that, that, that we, uh, you know, expected of a, a top notch restaurant. But he said to us, he said, when you get ready to go, because we came in on a side street, Bill Street is running east and west, and we came in on a side street, and went upstairs, kind of through a back way, and over, it had a canopy hanging there, we went up and into the restaurant, and then he said, you want, might want to go out this way, and go down, and, and we came down some real steep steps, right into the nightclub. And they had, they had a buffet set up down there, all kind of groceries, man. They was eating and kicking it. It was a guy about three times my size. He was swinging his woman and going on, man. And I thought, boy. And, and, and we were standing there just kind of observing what was going on. And, man, they had the guitars and bass. Guitar, that guy was working that bass and the lead guitar was. And after a while, my shoulders started going like that. I said, oh, no, no, no. I said, <laughs> I said, no, we better get out of here. <laughs> I told TJ, I told him, I said, no, we got to leave here. <laughs> all, all us church folk, all us church folk up in there, and my shoulders start moving. I'm like, nah, nah. I know when I'm being tempted, it's time to go. Amen, amen, amen. Let's get out of here. Leave BB Nim back there, amen. <laughs> Of course, everywhere you go down Beale Street, boy, they, they cooking. I mean, <laughs> Matt, you'd have loved that bass player, boy. He was rough. <laughs> but 
But you got to recognize your limits, right? You have to recognize your limits. And, and when things are pulling on you, if you're not careful, your flesh should get involved in some stuff. And, amen, amen. You'll you, you find yourself reckless eyeballing stuff. And, and yeah, yeah, your flesh will rise up. The Bible is clear. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not anything new. It went on in the Garden of Eden. And Jesus himself, the Christ, was tempted by it. Amen. The enemy came to him with the same three temptations. And this writer, John, the beloved disciple of the Lord, wrote in John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15, 16, and 7. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. He says, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. He says, it's not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abides forever we need to make up our minds that we're going to do the will of God I wish I had some help in here tonight my 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 we have to do the will of God well I have a two point proposition I want to lift up in your hearing tonight call to bring forth fruit and call to bear fruit number one we'll call to bring forth fruit Number two, we're called to bear fruit. In verse number 16, the Lord is helping his disciples to understand that they didn't just wake up one morning and decide that they were going to get saved. You know, some, sometimes folk think it was all about the choice they made. And sometimes even in testimony, you hear folk talking about, I found the Lord. 30 years ago. No. Well, that, that really wasn't how this happened. No, no. You, you really didn't find the Lord 30 years ago. No. One, one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is to convince the world of sin. Amen. And of righteousness. Are, are you listening? And it was he who came upon you and let you know that you needed to be saved. Amen. Amen. It was the spirit of the living God that spoke to you and me and helped us to understand that we were out of the will of God and that we needed to have our lives transformed by his power. So the spirit of God is the one that convicted us, brought us under conviction, led us to the foot of the cross and gave us to be able to see Christ for who he was and to accept him as Lord and Savior. And when we did that, that same Spirit of God baptized us into the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, By one Spirit are y'all baptized into one body, where you be Greek or Jew, where you be bond or free, have been all made to drink into one Spirit. We're one in Christ because of the Spirit of the living God. Watch this now. And then He came in us. Ah. Uh, and the, and the other thing he did, Ephesians 4, 30 says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God that have sealed you to the day of redemption. Not only did he convict us, but bring us to the foot of the cross. He came in us and then he sealed us to the day of redemption. I wish I had some help in here. So we didn't really find the Lord. He found us. I mean, you know, he, he came to wherever we were. Ah, just. He came where we were. Some of us was in the hokey tonk. Come on. Some of us was running around doing our own thing on our way to a devil's hell to be eternally separated from God. But it was God that got a hold of us and drew us to the Christ. So we really didn't find him. He found us. Can you agree? Amen. I, listen, I was having a good time doing what I was doing, I thought. A amen, amen, amen. Used to roll some up. A a yeah, amen. A used to roll some up. Yes, sir. Used to hit that Jack Black. Y'all on the Jack Daniels Black label. Schmidt Smart Liquor. Give me the bull. You, you, you know how it is. It, it, they had a commercial back years ago, and that bull would, 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 would. <laughs> Would, would, would come through and jump through a window and into a china closet and start turning around and tearing up stuff all in the closet. I said, that's just what I want. Give me some of that. 
Don't y'all look at me like that because some of y'all had the same kind of trouble as I had back in the day. Come on here. God delivered us from some stuff. God brought us out of some stuff. God transformed our lives. And I can't. Let me just get back to the classroom. Get back in the classroom. So then Jesus says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Not, not only did I choose you, but I ordained you. I appointed you. Watch this. For the express purpose of bringing forth fruit. And that that fruit, that fruit that they would go and gather, when we talk about bringing forth fruit, he's not talking about the manifestation of the spirit of the living God in the life of the believer. He's talking about the evangelistic bent of gathering the harvesting of the souls of men. Go bring forth fruit to the kingdom. Are you listening? That's different from bearing fruit. We're going to get there in a minute. But he's saying to them, here's why I called you. Here's why I've ordained you. Here's why I put my spirit on the inside of you. Here's why you've been set apart to this labor. The souls of men need to be harvested. And I've assigned that duty to your hand. To harvest the precious fruit of the earth. The souls of men and women. Boys and girls. Are you listening? And the other thing that's interesting is, he said, and that your fruit should remain. This eternal life that we have is everlasting and everlasting. It's I know people teach you can be in the day and out tomorrow and in the day and out tomorrow and in the day and out tomorrow and the next day and next week you can be lost and then the next time you can be saved and on and on and on and on it goes. But I believe that what he's telling them is the fruit that comes into the kingdom. True born again believers will remain. That fruit will remain until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mrs. Young, it's good to see you precious. God bless you. And so... Christ has chose some people to be about his business down here on the ground. And I would like to think that you and I, who were wayward in our own time, doing our own thing, going our own way, have been picked by God. Have been chosen by God for the express purpose of being about his business. And now I want you to know that there are some processes that one would have to go through to be used by God in this regard. There is an aggressive way to go about it, and that's what we do when we're preaching, propagating, spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like these men who had been picked by God to go about preaching, proclaiming the gospel message. Salvation is of the word of the living God. It comes uh, this imperishable seed that enters into the hearts of men comes into their ear, falls into their heart, and creates fruit. Now, I don't mean the outer ear and the inner ear and the eustachia tubes and the amber, the hammer, and the stirrup and all of that kind of stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the ears of the heart, the ears of the soul of people. The word of God comes into the souls of men. James 1.18 says of his own will be gathered us with the word of truth. This, this, this living word that comes into the heart of men transforms the life of men. 1 Peter 1.23 says being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible. By the word of God which liveth in the body forever is an imperishable seed. Now these people from Ebenezer, you've heard me say this a hundred times if not more. It creates life in us that will never die imperishable the seed of God the word of God is an imperishable seed and so we as we are being aggressive and going out and sowing this seed 
It finds the hearts of those who have been prepared by God to hear and receive this word. Listen, I, I, I've been sharing this verse that I stumbled upon, and, and I know I've read it a hundred times, if not more. Uh, Proverbs twenty twenty four that says, man's goings are of the Lord. How can a man then understand his own way? Let me, let, let me, let me give it to you again. Man's goings are of the Lord. How can a man then understand his own way? And what that verse says is, we don't even know where we're going. We don't even know that God is directing our hearts. He's directing our minds. And because we're in Christ tonight, it sure wasn't a choice we made. We'd have had our way, we'd have still been doing what we were doing. But God had a different plan. Aren't you glad about it? And like these disciples that have been called to be evangelist, he's called us to do the same. So there, there, there's, there's a, an aggressive way to go about bringing forth fruit. And then there's a passive way to go about bringing forth fruit. As we are fruit bearers, we can affect the world for the cause of Christ. Not necessarily having to proclaim, but just be. Here's what I mean by that. Being what God has called us to be as, is as powerful as doing what God has called us to do. Did you know that these people that are in the world can't see God, don't know God, can't see God, don't know the Christ, can't see the Christ? I this now. But there is a visible expression of the invisible God on the ground that's embodied in the local assembly, in the church. We are the visible expression of the invisible God on the ground. John, the same writer, says, as he is, so are we in this world. We are a visible expression. When men see us, they see what they cannot see of God. And so it's incumbent upon us that we be conformed to the image of his son. Now, let me say it again. It's incumbent upon us that we live our lives in such a way that we are a sweet smelling savor of heaven. Our lives ought to smell like heaven. Let's, let's back up. John says, verse 1, I am the true vine. My father is a husbandman. And every branch of me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So then Jesus is helping his disciples to understand that there is a process that they will have to go through in order that they might maximize the opportunity that he's given them and that their gifts might be manifest in a way that they're maximizing their gifts. And he gives them an analogy of a tree, if you will, or a bush that's got branches on it. And all of us can attest to the fact that, let's say in an apple tree, apples don't grow on the roots of the tree. Apples don't grow on the trunks of the trees. Apples don't even grow on the limbs of the trees. But the branches that shoot out from the limbs. And so Christ tells them that they are the branches. And so the fruit of, and the majesty of God should be manifest to the world by being manifest in their lives. Can you see it? But there is a process that they have to go through. Okay, stay with me. Stay with me. There's a process. Any 
orchard owner that owns apple trees or peach trees or plum trees or, or whatever kind of tree it is, if it's a fruit bearing tree, what that orchard owner will do is during the season that they're, the trees are bearing, they will go out and identify limbs that are leafing out. Maybe even blooming, but there's no fruit on them. And what the apple orchard owner will do is he will mark that limb. He will mark that limb. So that when the sap goes down in the tree, he's coming with the buzz saw. He coming with the buzz saw. He's getting ready to cut that limb off. You know why? Because that limb is sucking the nutrients from the limbs that are producing apples. And so I need to get rid of you. Because you, 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 you perpetrating. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you, you acting like you getting ready to put some apples on, but you ain't putting none on. So I got to get rid of you. You're taking glory away from the limbs that are actually producing the fruit. So Jesus is telling his disciples that they're getting ready to get pruned. He says he purges them. He, he cleanses them. He gets stuff out of them that's hindering them from maximizing their gifts. And last night was defrag night and we talked a lot about that. Getting rid of stuff that's hindering us. From shining as brightly as we ought to shine and being all that God would have us to be. Notice what he says to these guys. Verse number three. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Can you see it? The process that Christ used for cleansing his disciples or for pruning his disciples was the taught word. The living word. How many know the word of God is alive? Bible said in Hebrews 4 12 for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart it's a powerful word it's a living word it is a sanctifying word John 17 17 says sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth it has cleansing power and, and, and it'll do the same thing in your life if you drop anchor in the word of God daily and drink deeply from the wells of living water, it'll cleanse you too. It'll push stuff out of your belly that ought not be in there. I wish I had some help in here. I said the word of God will cleanse you. The word of God will sanctify you. The word of God will transform you. If you stay with it. Amen. You read it daily. You'll find a year from now. I'm changed. I'm, I'm different than I was last year. But you got to stay in there. You got to stay with it. Oh, yeah. oh, he'll work. Watch this. You'll be reading along and come under conviction. Be reading and saying, Lord, help me. Oh, you can't, wait, see, I ain't. If I had some honest folk, some honest folk will say, yeah, preacher. Be reading the word of God, man. It'll, it'll make you own up to some stuff. If, if you're really saved, if you're really a child of God, the word of God will check you. Amen. Amen. But we're looking for people who can bear fruit here because the bringing forth of fruit is an evangelistic outreach, but this bearing fruit is a little bit different ball game. Verse 4, he says, Abide in me and I in you as the, listen at this, listen at this. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. So he's given them to understand something by giving them a, a word picture to help them to understand. If you're going to be as fruitful as you can be, you need to stay attached. Anybody, anybody ever seen, you know, when we have storms come through, limbs fall off of trees? And you, you look at that limb the first day, the, the leaves are real pretty and green. Give it four or five days, you come back and they start, look like they're kind of wilting a little bit. Give it another week, you come back and they start, look like they're turning brown. You, you, you know why, don't you? 
You, you, you know why, don't you? Because the life-giving source for the limb is in the tree. And the life-giving force for the tree is in the ground. The earth provides everything that the tree needs to live and produce. Are you listening to me? I know this ain't no shouting message. But those roots down in the ground are sucking nutrients from the earth. Don't ask me how it works. But those green leaves on that tree somehow draw power from the sun that's trans laid it into an electrical charge that goes down through the trunk of the tree and into the roots and suck nutrients from the earth. It's called photosynthesis. Now, I don't know how all that works. <laughs> photosynthesis. Well, well, watch this. But God hung the world together in such a way that wow, Reverend Damon Scott, while we are breathing... And exhaling carbon dioxide. The tree is standing on the side saying, yeah, give it to me. Give me that carbon dioxide. And when he takes the carbon dioxide, he releases what? Oxygen. And we cry, give me the oxygen, baby. God has made this thing in such a way that we live by what the tree dispels. And, we, and they live by what we exhale. I wish I had some help in here. And all the while, God is working under the earth. Feeding the limbs. And them old apples just kind of hanging on the tree. They're just kind of hanging there. Sucking up glory from the, from the tree. They're sucking it from the earth. I wish I had some help in here. And every now and then, we'll go to the store. And get us one of them great big old Jonathan Apples. Or Washington Delight. Or Granny Smith. Come on. We'll grab us an apple. Whether we making a pie or not, mama. We're going to grab some apples. And, we gonna, and that apple is getting ready to fulfill this ministry. Because God allowed it to come on the tree. That it might feed our bellies. And give us a little satisfaction as we eat the apple. Come on and talk to me. But it's all designed by God. Can you see it? What Jesus is saying to his disciples is, listen, if you want to be fruitful, if you want to be one who are, is bringing forth fruit in your life, you need to stay attached to me. You need to be fastened to me. You need to be joined to me. Because if you are not joined to me, you can do nothing. How do you know we can't do anything? Except we stay connected to the Lord. We have to stay attached to him, Curtis Hammond Sr. We have to stay in him. It's not that we're going anywhere, but we can, we can, how many know there are a whole bunch of spiritual midgets walking around? Did you hear what I said? It's a whole bunch of spiritual midgets. Folk been in the, I've been in the, in the household of faith 30 years. Yep, yeah, and you're still two years old. Amen. You know why? Because we're not a body. We're not dropping anchor. We're not spending time on our knees in prayer. We're not seeking the face of the Lord. We're not reading the word of God. We're not fellowshipping frequently. We're not witnessing to other folk. We're not doing what God has called us to do and ordained us to do about his business. Praise the Lord. And so consequently, we wear the name. But we're not carrying the goods. We're testifying on the second floor, but we're living in the basement. We're talking about how saved, sanctified, and full of the Holy Ghost we are, but we are in the valley. God is on the mountaintop. We're down in the valley. Because we won't spend time. Because we won't abide. Because we won't meditate. Because we won't listen to good music. BB, BB will make your shoulder jump. But he ain't doing nothing for your soul. Did you hear what I said? I said, BB, amen. BB will uh, cause your shoulders to move, uh, cause your feet to pat, but he's not doing anything for the inner man. Uh, and I recognize, wait a minute, he got me going. I best get out of here. 
First Thessalonians 5, 22 and 23 says, Abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you holy. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to be what God wants you to be, bless God, you need to know when to run. You need to know when to back up. Amen. I heard a songwriter say you got to know when to hold up. You got to know when to fold up. You got to know when to... Oh, God. Jesus told them, without me, you can't do nothing. I've been in evangelism 41 years. Preached on states all across this nation, from Orlando, Florida, Orange Blossom Trail, to Garfield Park in Seattle, Washington. Amen. Washington, D.C., all the way out to 24th and Broadway in Phoenix, Arizona. Amen. Memphis, Tennessee, Nashville, Tennessee, We Tomka, Oklahoma, We Oak Muggy, Oklahoma, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Muskogee, Oklahoma, been to DeWitt, Arkansas, Dumas, Arkansas, Amen. West Helena, Arkansas. We've been preaching everywhere. Can't go anywhere. Can't do anything except God be with us. Baptized people in that cattle trough in Wichita, Kansas, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in Seattle, Washington, in Des Moines, Iowa. We put them in the water. Sure wasn't none of us. We can holler all we want to, but God is the one that draws folk to the foot of the cross. God is the one that brings people under conviction. I'm just saying to us tonight, if you really want to maximize your gifts and what God has called you, you need to spend time in the word of God. You need to stay connected to the tree, bless God. You need to hold on to the horns of the altar. To change come. Jesus said, not me, you can't do nothing. I'm ebonic using my down home words to help you understand this deep narrative and that's what Christ is doing he's using parabolic expression one of the few parabolic expressions used by John John is not a synoptic writer he's different than the other three writers and he used very few parables a vignette a piece of a story that they naturally understand that points to a far deeper spiritual truth. He's talking about trees and fruit bearing, but he's really talking about their spirituality and what can happen in their lives when they stay attached to him. Notice what he says in verse 5. I'm the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, listen to what he says, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. nothing. Are you listening? Oh, yeah. The beauty of staying attached to the Lord and having the Spirit of God in us is that the divine God of glory that we cannot see will start to be manifest in our lives daily. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 lists nine manifestations of the spirit of the living God that lives in the heart of every born again believer. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. I mean, I mean, the spirit of God is able to make you to love unloving people. The spirit of God will allow you to hate, to love haters, people that hate on you. You got haters on your job. You walk in, they mean mugging you. You just walk back, good morning. Can y'all see it? Good morning. They, 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 they want to backstab you so bad. If looks could kill, y'all been dead a long time ago. But the spirit of the living God won't let you do to them what they're doing to you. Are you listening? long suffering he gives us the ability to put up with some stuff ah, ah. the Holy Ghost the spirit of the living God gives us power 
to put up with some stuff. Anybody in here ever had to put up with some stuff? Wait, wait, wait. If I don't talk to nobody else, preachers know what I'm talking about. Pastors know what I'm talking about. We have to put up with some stuff. So every now and then. Everybody that's sitting in congregations ain't with the preacher. Come on. Y'all don't have to say nothing, y'all. Don't, don't clap because they got some video going in here. <laughs> It'll be on Facebook before we get to the house. Amen. Amen. I got home last night and heard myself preaching. I'm like, hey! What, what in the world? Y'all need to quit doing that, boy. <laughs> But the Spirit of God empowers us. It enables us. Any duna word in the Greek text, any word that starts with D-U-N-A, means it is enabling. Dunamis is the root word for dynamite. It gives us power to do what you cannot do in and of yourself. So sometimes when you have to be long suffering with folk to short with you. Keep on praying because after a while God is going to move on the main altar of their hearts and he'll transform their lives. I remember being in Vietnam in 1968 and 69 kicking it and doing everything I thought I was big and bad enough to do in my Pope mama back here in Kansas City and down in Oak Margie, Oklahoma on her knees bless God praying me through that wall. I never got a scratch in 11 months and 23 days when folk are dying all around me. God kept because that woman bit her knees and prayed. Oh God. Be long suffering. Stay with it. Hang on to the horns of the altar. Change will come. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Verse number eight. Here it is. Verse number eight. Herein in this is my father glorified here it is that ye bear much fruit watch this that ye bear much fruit and it will be a divine declaration here's what he says so shall ye be my disciples Bear some fruit. Fruit glorifies God. Fruit magnifies the Christ. Fruit speaks volumes about whose we are and who he is. Fruit to the kingdom and fruit being manifest in our lives says something about our father. I preached a series one time called Who's Your Daddy? From 1 John. Took me probably four, five, maybe even six months to preach that series. Who's Your Daddy? I might have to get all them cassette tapes. <laughs> Put over the DVCDs or something. Been years ago. But how we live our lives, where we go, what we say. Oh, watch this. How we treat other people. How husbands sacrificially give for their wives. Uh, I felt that. Y'all don't like me. Sacrif husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Sacrificially giving. Meeting the needs of your mate. Wives responding as the daughters of Sarah. The only time you hear the word reverend in the Bible is twice. Once toward God and the other one, wives see that you reverence your husband. Nowhere else is anybody called reverend. I know we like it, reverend doctor this and reverend doctor that. It ain't in there. 
know we like it. This is Reverend so and so. I'm Reverend so and so. You, 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 brother so and so. Nowhere in the Bible is any man called Reverend except the husband for the wife. Search it out. You think I'm joking? Read it for yourself. So don't come to me with all that rapping so and so. No. My, I'm Brother Jesse. That's what they've been calling me ever since I got saved. And I'm good with that. Brother Jesse. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. That's my friend over there. Yeah. I, I ain't beating you up for what you say. Y'all can say what you want to say. I'm just saying. Don't try to put that trip on me. Show me some fruit. Look like him. Oh, I'm out of time. Man, I'm, out. I'm out of time, man. Last night, Pastor Snodgrass said, don't look at that clock. I got to look at the clock. It's a quarter nine. Tomorrow is hallelujah night. I ain't quite through with this yet. Tomorrow is hallelujah night. The first night is defrag night. The second night is teaching night. And the third night is hallelujah night. So tomorrow night, we're going to do it. We're coming with our praising shoes on. We're coming to worship tomorrow night. We're coming to magnify the Lord tomorrow night. The Ebenezer Missionary Baptist Church Choir will be here to help us. Amen. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Praise the Lord. I'm talking a lot about this business of abiding. Let me give you some keys to abiding because, and I've been talking a little bit about it, because I can tell you what we ought to be doing, but not tell you how. Okay? So number one, we need to be praying daily. The fact of the matter is, I would encourage you to establish a personal devotion time. And even develop prayer partners if you, if you need to, to help you to stay on point. Are you listening? We need to pray daily. Don't, don't short circuit the business of prayer. Because when you go to God in prayer... There is a divine interchange. There's, it's divine intercourse, if you will. When you are bowing before God, heaven bows down. And there's something going on there. And that's why when you come out of your prayer closet and go to your job and the haters are at you, it's just bouncing off. Because you got something from heaven that day that's keeping you. Are you listening? something going on there you're, you're being empowered from on high when you bend your knees or bow your head in prayer now I'm not exalting uh, the position a posture of prayer over the fact of prayer or the matter of prayer I mean you can be praying while you're washing dishes or running the vacuum or throwing a load of clothes in it ain't, you ain't got to be on the side of the bed it, come on now so I'm not exalting position a posture over the, the substance of what you're doing. So prayer is essential if you're going to be fruitful. Bible reading is essential for being empowered daily and for fruit bearing. Bible reading, meditation, thinking on those things that you've read. Matter of fact, to think on some stuff that's godly will keep you in peace. Isaiah, y'all know what I'm talking about. 26.3, that would keep him in perfect peace whose mind stayed on thee. The apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the church at Philippi, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. There be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things you both learned and received and heard and seen and me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. So thinking on the things of the Lord will cause you to be even killed and settled in your heart as you go about your day. And then, of course, fellowshipping. There's something to be said for koinonia. 
When you come into unity with other believers, that's why Jesus sent his disciples out two by two. When one's down, the other one's up. When that one's down, the other one's up. God has a way of nurturing the duo. And it can happen in your house. My wife pulled me off the ceiling more than once. <laughs> Preacher God ain't said nothing. Oh, better come on down. Get your, get your feet back on the floor. Amen. I've about been out of Ebenezer, I don't know how many times. My, my wife was here, well, you know something. God ain't said nothing, you ain't going nowhere. <laughs> These Ebenezer, I just can't believe it. <laughs> she pulled me down. Come on down. Because when I'm at a place of discouragement, she's encouraged. She's at a place of discouragement, I'm encouraged. So we can encourage one another in the house. Uh, Y'all can't see it. Koinonia is worth its weight in gold. Fellowship is worth its weight in gold. To show up at a Bible study. To show up at a women's meeting or a brotherhood meeting. To show up at church school. To show up at a morning worship is worth its weight. And you're not just wasting time. You're being empowered. You're being affected. You're being impacted. The anointing of God rests in the house. I'm telling you, folks. And then finally, witnessing. As you pour out the glory of God that he's put on the inside of you, there's a way for him to replace it. Jesus stood and cried in that last day of the feast. And John 7, 37, 38, and 39. If any man thirsts, let him come unto me a drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And this spake he of the spirit, that they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given for Christ. Jesus was not yet glorified. Well, he's been glorified now. And we have living water in our bellies and we can pour it out. And we can drink deeper from that well daily. And I'm telling you, there's no substitute for it. Praying, reading, meditating, fellowshipping. And witnessing those five things. If you do those things, you'll have victory in your lives. A vessel of honor for Jesus. Come help me, Shirley. A vessel of honor for Jesus. Sanctified, holy, that I might be a vessel of honor for God, a vessel of honor for Jesus. Do you want to be a vessel of honor? A vessel of honor for Jesus. Sanctified, holy, that I of honor for God Lord prepare will there be one tonight who will accept my prayers to be be a saint sanctuary if you will stand to your feet right where you are and Right and true and with thanksgiving I'll be a living sanctuary 
God, our Heavenly Father, these who are standing, we pray that you would touch them from the crowns of their heads to the very soles of their feet. Empower each one. Fasten to the walls of their hearts a determination to be a light in a dark place. To be about your business. To take advantage of every witnessing opportunity that you allow to come their way. Stir in them, pour in them a, a mind to seek your face in prayer. Give them an insatiable appetite to read your word. Give them a mind, O oh God, to fellowship frequently. Give them, dear God, to meditate upon your word. Those good things that you've given to us in your book. Help us to be conformed to the image of your son. Help us to be vessels of honor. Help us to be sanctuaries. To be a place for you to manifest yourself through. To demonstrate to a lost and dying world that there is a reality in serving the true and the living God. We thank you for it, Lord. There may be somebody here struggling in their health. We ask you to be gracious as you are. A healer and a deliverer, a way maker, a burden bearer. Lift up the hung down head. Let the weak say I'm strong. Let the discovers be encouraged on tonight. Let the sick say I'm well. In Jesus' mighty name. We'll be so very careful, dear God, to give your name the praise. It's in the name of Jesus, who is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that we pray and call it done. And all of God's people said, Amen and Amen. Thank you, Shirley. I, I do want to offer you an opportunity, those of you who may not be a child of God tonight. You may never have said, Lord, I don't need you in my heart. I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. If you're here tonight and you can't remember a time that you asked Christ into your heart, Today is a good day to say, Lord, here I am just like I am. I need to know that I know that I know. If I should close my eyes tonight, I would spend eternity in your presence. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8b, willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. You can know that you know that you know you're on your way to heaven. And if you can't say of a surety that Christ is in your heart, this is a good time to say, Lord, here I am, just like I am. And he'll accept you tonight. He will. Jesus will accept you tonight. If there's somebody here that's backslidden, have started down this road and for whatever reason turn around and went the other way. Today is a good day to rededicate and reconsecrate your life to the Lord. Listen, and I'm telling you, if you're on the pew and you know that's you, don't sit on the pew. Get up and make your calling and election sure. Because unless you're a twin or a triplet or a quad or a quint, you're going to die by yourself. You were born by yourself, you're going to die by yourself. And you need to know that you're going to meet the Lord in peace on the day that you close your eyes. And we all will have to breathe out our lives sweetly someday. You want to have blessed assurance that you belong to him. Is there anybody here without a church home? There are a number of churches represented here tonight. We'd love to send you wherever you'd like to go. Will there be one? Said, preacher, I don't have a church home, but I'd like to go to this church or your fellowship or Pastor Johnson's fellowship or Pastor McNeil or Pastor Tolliver. We've got pastors in here tonight. Pastor Groves. That means you'll have to drive all the way to Marshall, Missouri to go to his church. But, amen. But we'll send you. You can ride with him and Sister Evangeline, his wife. Amen. I won't belabor the time. Amen. We'll be back tomorrow night. We were out of here at the same time last night, weren't we? God is good. Amen. I'm going to turn it back over to brother.
Let us say amen again. Amen. Certainly we heard a powerful, powerful, powerful preacher tonight. No fake news. It's the real thing. Thank Pastor Frazier. Thank you. As usual, is there any announcements? No announcements tonight. We are turning back over to Pastor Frazier to dismiss us, but we will not have the benediction tonight. We will just have that dismissal. But remember, tomorrow night, tomorrow night, if you're not here, you will miss it. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. 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 Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. 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 Right where you are, dear God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you. For all our ears have heard and our hearts have felt. We ask you to go with us and stand by us. Take us safely over the dangerous streets, lanes, and highways. Safely to our homes and wherever our roads would lead us. Then at the appointed time tomorrow night, give us to find ourselves in a place of worship. Giving glory, honor, and praise your great name. It's in the name of Jesus, who is the Christ, the Son of the living God, we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. God keep you.